Increasing numbers of critics contend the Constitution is an outdated document. Some even argue it should be discarded. Why is it still relevant? Todd. Well, first, let me just say thank you to Bob Shannon and to all the folks that have shown up here tonight. Um, I'm with a very distinguished group of talented uh, academics here and elected officials, and it just goes to show you, uh, from my point of view, that I think Coolidge said, persistence is the most powerful thing in the world. So that puts me up here. This is something we've been in, uh, engaged in for years. The Constitution, the Founding Fathers recognized human nature. And to me, that's a defining element of our Constitution. It recognizes that individuals uh, are not perfect, that they have to have limitations upon them, they have to have accountability upon them. And our original Constitution has those things in place, and it is still valid today. Jamie? Well, it's good to be here in Hanover and see so many great friends. And uh, I guess one announcement would be I found out when I pulled into your parking lot that I will officially be becoming a Hanoverian in August. I'll be moving to Hanover. We just bought a farm. So. You'll be seeing a lot more of me, but um, this is a this is a great question about whether or not the Constitution is relevant. Uh, obviously, many people in the U.S. might not feel that it is relevant. They think it is a living and breathing document. Um, many people don't know what's in the Constitution, so they don't know the answer one way or the other. I find that a lot with students uh, that, that I teach. But the reason the Constitution is relevant and important is because it is what makes us the exception uh, in the world. In that we don't base things based on a democracy, about, we don't base it on the majority of the will, will of people. We also are not an, arist an aristocrat aristocracy, um, although we're bordering on that. <laughs> um, the, we're lobbyists and, and unions and every other interest group are making decisions. We are based on a rule of law. And that it is, it is an objective rule of law in which we make decisions. We believed, and the founders believed, that there was a black and white, right and wrong, in this country and in the world. They believed in a higher power, and they believed in God, and they thought that politicians and citizens and everyone else should be held accountable to that rule of law. And so the Constitution established that so that no matter what the persuasions of people, if those changed, the, the thing, the underpinning, the thing that kept people pinned down was the Constitution. It needs to be relevant because our, our country cannot function without it. We have a balance of powers. Our founders believed in federalism, so they didn't believe just in a balance of power between the federal branches, but they believed in a balance of powers between local, state, and federal government. And all those things are outlined in our Constitution. Ooh, I like him. <laughs> so, Jamie says I'm cheating because I have a, a stopwatch in front of me. <laughs> First, I want to thank you guys for having me here. Um, uh, I tell people that I aspire to be the most pre predictable person in the entire Virginia General Assembly. And, and, and when I ran for office, um, I was very unabashed about being a I call myself a constitutional conservative. There's a little libertarian bent in there. We'll probably get around to about halfway through the forum. Um, but, I, but, I, but I've been honored to have the opportunity to serve. And when I got invited to speak to the Mechanicsville Tea Party, I thought, gosh, somebody's noticed. So, so thanks for having me. Um, the reason that uh, people would disregard the Constitution uh, is arrogance, plain and simple. Uh, and that is that, that we believe that by virtue of our position uh, on a timeline of human history that we are somehow more enlightened or, or more knowledgeable than those who preceded us. When I would argue, frankly, that as it relates to fundamental um, issues, whether it's how to shoe a horse or pound a piece of a pig iron, uh, we're less knowledgeable. But there are fundamental truths, I think, about humans that have not changed for time immemorial and that, they, that never will. And the Constitution is essentially a rule book that recognizes that everything that we have is given to us by a higher power, right? The Declaration of Independence cites that rank order of things. So everything we have is given to us by a higher power, and right? anything we give away, we give away by our own consent. The Constitution says we give it away by our own consent first.
first to the states, and then the states, with the agreement of the people, Ninth Amendment, everybody likes the Tenth, I do too, but the Ninth Amendment says everything that does not split before comes back to the people. But, but the reason that people want to disregard the Constitution is arrogance and a fundamental failure to recognize that there are certain truths as to human nature. And so that's it. I got one second. Stopwatch. Second question. If the Constitution is a well thought out document designed to protect our citizen, citizenry from an oppressive and tyrannical government, why have so many citizens ignored its value? Senator Garrett, you just answered that with ignorance, and maybe you can delve into that a little bit deeper. Arrogance, not ignorance. My, my answer could have been ignorant. <laughs> <laughs> um, th the reason is that we're, we're blessed with the incredible uh, multitude of blessings uh, that cause us to be what I like to call a microwave oven society. That is, that we want instantaneous gratification. The other thing is that a lot of conservatives aren't as well-versed as they should be on our constitutional underpinnings because we're busy trying to work and support our family. And so we, we can watch, and I've had this conversation briefly with Todd when I came in, uh, what's happened in the last, what's been revealed in the last day, uh, week, six months was far, far greater than what caused us to declare war uh, and independence uh, from Britain. Um, and so, but we're all distracted and we, and we have, have we secured shelter and food and, and hopefully love and companionship on that, on that Maslow's hierarchy of needs triangle, we're there. And so, and so the most, most fundamental things we kind of miss. I, I made this comment to somebody in a conversation earlier today. I'm not, I'm not I, you know, I'm, I'm almost ready to get the pitchfork and march on the Capitol, but I got stuff to do with my life. And I said, I almost kind of feel guilty because, you know, what's been perpetrated against the citizenry, like right? we can add the Fourth Amendment to the list of dead met parts of the bills, Bill of Rights now too. Um, but I'm not gonna do it because I, I wanna I wanna I wanna pursue my job and go to the beach and raise my kids and all these things. And and so I think the reason that the that people don't recognize its value is because we're too caught up in the day to day to, to consider the sublime, the, the real basic um, um, underpinnings uh, of, of what has given us, what's secured the blessings for us. Um, and so that's it. I got nine seconds left. You know, in the uh, in 1300s, you had John Woodcliffe and John Huss, who were sort of the predecessors to the Reformation. And then you had Calvin and and um, and many others that came along. Uh, Eric Zwingli, who also established the Reformation, and that had a huge impact on government. It had a huge impact on our founding fathers as well, because. The way the Constitution is structured is this idea that we self-govern yes. ourselves. And they could do that because of the fact the Reformation had had on individuals of a sense of morality, the sense of virtue, and the sense of right and wrong. And that was why the Constitution worked, because the government had its job and individuals in the churches had had their jobs. And when they set up the government, when you read the declaration, like, like um, thanks for the time clock, by the way. Um, it was a holy covenant. God was above. And then you had, whether it was government, social acts, art, all those things that fell out underneath it. But you had a fixed con constant. We don't have that now. We don't have a covenant. We have a contract between people. And guess what you can do to contracts? You can amend them. And what we do is we amend them based on the will of people, and the will of the majority, and what we want to do. And so we see us moving away from that fixed constant, and we find ourselves moving to whatever is the whim of the day. And that is the fear that we have with the Constitution, is whether or not we're going to have that fixed constant in our morality and our virtues, as well as in the rule of law, because our government cannot function without it. All right, great stuff. I want to preface this just a little bit. It's just my nature to look for solutions. So whenever I address something, I try to go to the root cause, what actually started this. So 
most of the ladies will know, when I sit down with my wife and she just wants to talk, I want to fix the problem. And that doesn't always go over well. Uh, why do so many citizens ignore our Constitution? To me, it's been clear for some time that the root cause is prosperity. We have become a prosperous people. That requires a lot of work on our part. And when you work hard, then you think you deserve things. So we deserve vacations, uh, etc., uh, recreational activity, and all of those things take us away from our duties. Now, I think the, the program showed me as a citizen advocate. I actually call myself a citizenship advocate because many of our citizens have forgotten their role and they don't fulfill those citizenship duties that we did in the past. And I just remind you, you know, most of us know, uh, as we read through the Old Testament, the Bible, we'd see the Israelites would have great distress, and they'd turn to God, and they would live disciplined, virtuous lives, and they would become very successful. Soon after they became very successful, the next generation thought that that success had just come about because they were such good people, and then they fell apart. And you see the same thing in civilizations. It's not rocket science, so it's that prosperity. One of the things I've noticed in my generation is the discarding of the Sabbath day. That's a discipline that God gave people just to step back from their material duties and look at their spiritual and family duties. Uh, just tonight I had two emails where individuals said, I would love to be here tonight, but I have sports activities with my children. Our public schools and colleges doing an adequate job teaching our students the value of the Constitution. If your answer is no, how would you remedy? Ms. Radke, let's start with you. I was say if it's a yes, no question, this is going to be very short. <laughs> um, they're not doing an adequate uh, job. Most of you, I think, are even informed with the, the new threats in education with Common Core that's been coming along into the education system and infiltrating not just public education, but also in private education and homeschool curriculum as well. Uh, I, I find all the time that uh, if it isn't a part of the SOLs, they don't know it. <laughs> I mean, frankly, they don't know it. And I, I hesitate to say that there should be requirements because I hesitate to think that the government is going to establish what those requirements are. Um, so, I guess what I would say to you is that the first thing is, is it goes back to the idea of self-responsibility. It is your responsibility to teach your generation and your children and your grandchildren what they need to know about the Constitution and about citizenship. It's not your, the school's responsibility. If you're relying on the school to educate your children, then you're the one that's at fault, not your government. Um, I homeschool my children because I don't want anyone infiltrating their brain except for mom and dad when it comes to education. Uh, if you're going to set some standards up on the Constitution and require it, it should be done at the school board level. Because I, frankly, would get rid of the Department of Education so they couldn't set any standards. Um, well, I, I think that, that education is best when it is closest to the parents. When the parents and the teachers are making the decision about what's taught, that's how it's done in private school. If you go to Banner Christian School or you go to Fairfax Christian School or anywhere else, the parents and the teachers are making those decisions about what's going to be taught. And that's the way it should be in public school. You should sit down with your school board members and those decisions should be made. But they'll tell you, a school board member will tell you right now, they don't have that liberty right now. They don't have that flexibility. Parent, teachers don't even have the flexibility to teach what they want to teach and they're supposed to be the experts. That's, that's the trick question of the night. Um, I think Jamie nailed it, though. The, the, the tendency, the temptation uh, for people in the General Assembly and, and, and on your local boards of supervisors is that we can legislate a correction. Um, and the problem that arises there, I think Jefferson paraphrased, said essentially government closest to home governs best. And, and that's why I say Jamie nailed it. Um, so we need to power down um, some of this sort of thing. But there are several answers that I think I can give um, that I think might be helpful, as opposed to dictating curriculum, we need to uh, make sure that we select uh, textbooks that are that are useful. Yeah. 
uh, because the reality of it is, I, I, my, my daughter has been at Piedmont Christian School for, I guess, nine years for the oldest. She's going to public school next year for because of the sports, because people miss the meeting. Um, and and I, know I'm, I know I'm throwing her into, into a cauldron. I've had this conversation with her. Um, but ultimately, the textbooks that, that our schools have to choose from are driven, you know, primarily by the large purchaser universes. And something that I've looked into and worked on is from a legislative perspective, although we haven't gotten the bill crafted, is, is a consortium of states that are similarly uh, opined uh, to the Commonwealth for the time being, um, where we can create the sort of numbers needed to drive the textbook industry to provide textbooks that taught uh, the values of the Constitution and, and, the, and the merit of the United States as the best nation on the face of the planet. So maybe we would join with the South Carolina and the Tennessee and the Kentucky and the Georgia so that we had the numbers to keep up with the Californians of the world. Um, another one is to revalue the Constitution, that is to re-emphasize the value of the Constitution inside society as a, as a whole. You do that. I've never driven through any locality in Virginia where I see the signs of what the work that the Tea Party does it, that, that brings us back to our constitutional roots. This is, you guys are the pinnacle. Um, and, and then, I got six seconds. And then also, as opposed to placing more requirements perhaps on the students, more hoops to jump through, we might ought to have some basic minimum standards for what our teachers uh, know before they get in the classroom and teach. One of the things we need to understand uh, is that liberals have had a, made a concerted effort to influence certainly our colleges. Uh, those that couldn't make a living, couldn't become prosperous out of the real world, have chosen to stay in college, and they see that as a calling to uh, share their worldview with these college students. And that's a real challenge. And part of that is because conservatives uh, tend to be more self-responsible and we've gone into other areas. But I would encourage, you know, you uh, parents here, grandparents, to encourage your children to become teachers and uh, to offer a different point of view. Um, one of the things that makes our country work, and it was noted by uh, Alexis de Tocqueville in 1860-63, he wrote his book on the American experiment, and he noted particularly that, in the quote is from New England, that the average man knew the tenets of his religion and he knew how his government worked. And this fascinated him coming from France, where most of the people were illiterate and didn't know how their government worked and had struggled through, I forget how many governments uh, in those few years after their revolution. Uh, my wife and I had four children here in Hanover County and I'd like to say that we self-educated or self-directed. The oldest daughter went all the way through the public system Graduated from VCU, is working, paying taxes in New York City. The second uh, son, by the fifth grade, we pulled him out and uh, he stayed at different venues, went back for his junior and senior year to high school. Um, so we, we chose that different path. But Jamie's absolutely correct that that's a parental responsibility. One other principle I've noticed over the years is that whenever government steps forward to help somebody, if it's parents, then parents step back. Yeah. It's just a natural reaction. So you end up not helping and strengthening the situation. You actually weaken it. And that's something we need to understand. That's... Thank you. Social conservatives want traditional values reinforced by government policy. Is this philosophy counter to how strict constitutionalists or libertarians want government to stay out of our personal lives? Todd. Number four. Unelected bureaucrats. Social conservatives. I was concentrating on that whistle. He threw me off. <laughs> Distracting our speakers. Exactly. I'm convinced, and have been for some time, that our lack of values is what's going to destroy us as a people. And frankly, I think it's uh, what's viewed very lightly today, uh, sex outside of marriage, uh, it's very common, and yet it's what produces the bulk of the abortions in America. It's what produces the bulk of the single parents in America. And these young men, especially, growing up in single parent homes, uh, if you look at all the statistics, they cause a, a great deal of uh, trouble in our society. Um, so that's a major problem. Can we work together? I think there's no doubt that we can. And I would say it goes back to, uh, 
you'll hear this theme throughout tonight, candidate selection. There are those individuals that can articulate why we as a free people need to support uh, moral practices and moral behaviors. When I see a value, I say that's a behavior. So you can have individuals, and you love individuals, but you can disagree with their behavior. And government can influence behavior because it has either a positive outcome or a negative outcome. And I think that's something that uh, needs to be part of our discussion. I'm really passionate about this subject. Is your, if you're leaving the uh, church tonight, if you look at my license plate, it says virtue. That's my license plate. Um, how many of you in this room would classify yourself not necessarily as Republican, but as Libertarian? I, I knew one hand was going to go up at least. <laughs> okay. I had a strong Libertarian following in my Senate campaign, and I would say that I'm pretty close to being probably more Libertarian than Republican. But with this caveat, I don't believe that you can have Libertarianism without a moral framework. It doesn't, it doesn't work. It results in anarchy. And George Washington himself said that um, there was a difference between liberty and licentiousness. Um, that the two are not the same. So it's important to have a moral framework and with social conservatives. As a matter of fact, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a pastor in Germany during World War II with the concentration camps, actually came over here to the United States. And he, one of the things that he noticed about the United States that made the United States different even different than England, where he had been doing interning as a pastor, is he had gone into the black churches, and he said that there was a, a spirit of, of liberty and a spirit of morality and that undergirded the churches. And he said that the foundation of the churches was the secret to the United States. We have to have morality in order for a republic to work. Jefferson said it, Madison said it, Washington said it, all our founding fathers said it. It does not work. A constitutional republic does not work without morality. Now the question becomes, who determines the morality? I don't know if that's the next follow-up question, because I can't do that in two minutes uh, with what I've already said. That's, that's really the question, because it wasn't the responsibility of the government. Initially, it was the responsibility of churches. So what happens when the churches and the community fail at their job?
blamed for election losses. The suggestions range from scaring off the moderates to extremist candidates can't win. Is this depiction accurate or fair? I think to some extent it's fair. Again, uh, individuals running for elected office need to understand their audience. And there are things that would be very uh, acceptable in this audience, in a church, uh, that we would like. There were things that would be very acceptable in a Republican convention hall that the people would love that would not be palatable to a general audience. Uh, I go back to candidate selection. You need to seek out and find these individuals that have the ability to share that message in a uh, acceptable manner. I always think of Pat Buchanan. I, I always liked his positions. I thought he articulated them well. But when he smiled, he looked mean. And he could never win. So he's gone on to be a very successful uh, author and uh, conservative talk show host. But he didn't have the, the right skill set to share that with people. So uh, for me, that is a concern. Uh, I've seen it happen a number of times. Mark Early, um, Mike Ferris, um, Holly North. You had the moderate Republican actually seek out another candidate to run in the same race. Uh, because they felt those candidates were too far to the right. So I think that is a concern. Uh, part of it is we needed a group of activists to back up these individuals who are willing to speak truth. But without that, we kind of leave them hanging and they appear to be uh, too far to the right of the political scale. And uh, we lose. And then that sets the tone for the next race. I think that it's not just on this question, but for conservatives in general, it's been our inability to articulate our message in an effective manner that has been the stumbling block for many people. You, you can say things, as I tell my children, that they can ask their brother or their sister something, either the really nice way or the really mean way, and it's the same thing in articulating our message in a way that's compelling. And I also think that there's been some inconsistency in our approach. I think this is why sometimes, a lot, oftentimes, libertarians struggle with Republicans as well. Because we talk about limited government, we talk about wanting to get government out of the federal government, and that we want things closest to the people, smaller government, local, local government, and then social conservatives will turn right around and say, but we want you to solve all these social problems and we want you to do it at the federal government. And people sort of do a double take. Um, so do you believe in federalism and limited government or don't you? And so I think as social conservatives, you have to be consistent about where your values are, what you believe, and who it is that is supposed to take care of those. Is it the church? Is it state government? Is it the federal government? And depending on the issue you're talking about, my answer would be different. Now in life, I do believe that it can be, it's a federal issue because that was in the Declaration and we have a responsibility to protect. The policing powers belong to the state um, and those policing powers should not be at the federal government. So I think it does become an issue of being able to articulate our message and show how it is consistent with giving people responsibility, self-responsibility and choice and how that fits in the framework of the Constitution. And that it's not just a, your whim against their whim. Your feelings about how you'd like it to be versus their feelings about how they want it to be. That's where we lose people in elections. Okay, I don't, I'm going to take a slight exception with Todd and, and say that I agree with you. I absolutely do agree, but I think it's perception that kills social conservative candidates. I think that Mark Early and, and Ferris and North was because the Republican apparatus backed out on them as much as anything. Yeah. Uh, and, it's, and, 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 it, and it was just happening again now with, um, with uh, the, the current statewide slate, and I hear it and it disgusts me. Um, but ultimately, all these extremists, when you boil down their values and you go to do a man on the street interview, their values are getting 75 80 percent approval. The Republican Party of which I'm a part by virtue of the fact that it was the vehicle that allows me to have the honor to serve, um, uh, 
doesn't do a good job of messaging. We complain and we lament the media. I have people in my caucus and leadership roles who, when I stand up after five Democrats have spoken about the virtues of a bill, and I stand up and say why it's a bad bill, they roll their eyes and yawn because why am I talking? Everybody already knows how everybody's going to vote. And I say I'm talking because the people at the press table are furiously writing down notes and will complain tomorrow that we don't have any message in the paper because we didn't stand up and talk because we figured everybody already knew how everybody's going to vote. Exactly. So, but, but I will say this, and if it makes, it sound, makes me sound mercenary, so be it. I, I, when I was working for a candidate seven years ago, like when, maybe somebody said it before me, but I'm the first one I know of. You don't, need, you don't need to change what you believe in order to change what you talk about. So, for example, if you're a Republican nominee for governor and you're in Arlington, you shouldn't lead with your pro-life credentials. If you're asked about them, tell the darn truth. But select your message based on your audience. It's basic fundamental marketing in your product. You know, so we do a poor job at that, but always tell the truth, but select your message. The other thing is, uh, sometimes we lead with the wrong message and it makes us unelectable. I was watching a House of Delegates primary here recently where one of the candidates... Oh, that's a cliffhanger. <laughs> <laughs> See he didn't say we had to obey him, Tom. <laughs> corner, corner him after the, uh, the forum here. He'll okay. finish that. Okay, fiscal conservatives distinguish between funding essential versus non-essential government services. In your own words, give us an example of non-essential government services and what government programs you would defund or shutter entirely. Senator. Well, one of the candidates, don't miss the lab. Well, one of the candidates um, in his announcement said that he would work uh, at the state level to make sure that we repealed the 17th Amendment. And the first thing I thought when I read it was, that's awesome, I love him, he can't possibly win. Because I, I, we need to repeal the 17th Amendment. It's absolutely destroyed the federal system by removing a real check we had on what, what Washington does. But you don't run campaigns on that because the vast bulk of the electorate goes, huh? Um, okay. So, this question is six. Okay, I got in so much trouble during my primary for telling the truth, but it was one of the most fun things I got to do. We were asked this question at a, we had a five-way Republican primary. They said, what entity would you eliminate in government? And I said, the DEQ. So then when I got a Democrat opponent in the general, what did they say? He, he hates clean air and clean water and wants to poison our streams. But my point was that where there's, we've, we've relinquished the 10th Amendment. There's nothing enumerated about the power to regulate the environment, so it belongs to the state. But as soon as we got an EPA, if we can't get rid of the EPA, why do we have a DEQ? It's redundancy. So people who have to comply with DCR and DEQ get one set of state regs and then another set of federal regs. And believe it or not, y'all all know this because I'm preaching to the choir, sometimes when you're in compliance with one, you're in violation of another. So how's the job creator, my, time, my clock's not even on now. So how's the job creator supposed to supposed to react? So we got to cut redundancy. It's it's it's. It's just plain silly. Uh, the Federal Department of Education is another one. Jamie touched on it. I mean, you know, I, I like education probably more than the next guy, but we need to determine which level of, of government the action is appropriately undertaken at and then eliminate the others. And so, there. Well, since uh, Tom is a state senator and talked about the, some issues at the state level, and I ran for U.S. and I'll talk about the federal level, um, there's a significant number, you guys can all pick your favorites because there's a number we could absolutely abolish. Um, the first that I'll start with, given all the news, is the IRS. <laughs> um, the second would be the Federal Reserve, needs to go. Um, Department of Education, the EPA needs to go. Um, and the list goes on and on. I mean, you, you cannot limit government unless you get rid of most of it. It's um, all the concentration of power is up in Washington, D.C. So our ability to influence government is significantly restrained by the fact that it is concentrated in Washington. Your ability to influence and have an impact is much more significant if you can call Tom on the phone, I know he's not your elected official, or call Chris Pace or whoever, versus having to try to get through to Tim Kaine. <laughs> Um, it's a much bigger challenge. So I would, I would cut, I would abolish actually all those, and then I'd cut a number of them back as well. I would get rid of all the aid we give all around the world, and that we can't service ourselves, but we're going to spread money around, and give it to terrorist organizations and Muslim brotherhoods and everything else. So there's a lot that can be done. 
um, what's lacking is the political will to do it, and the political will is lacking because the electorate has not shown in mass numbers yet that they care enough. I wanted to follow up just a second and clarify. Uh, Tom mentioned with the conservative candidates that the Republican establishment was the problem. But the thing we need to understand is that those individuals aren't evil. They're not against us per se. But the candidates, their perception of those candidates was too far to the right. And we can't change that perception. So that's a reality. We need to either re-educate them so that they see the value in a more conservative candidate, but being upset with the Republican establishment does us no good. That doesn't forward our movement. So we need to realize that and move on. Uh, I want to, these have mentioned a number of things uh, that we would like to get rid of. I'd just like to remind everybody that Governor McDonald, when uh, he became our governor, proposed cutting uh, two, aid, two, two state agencies, 19 boards and commissions, and deregulating three professions. And I do serve on the, the board for lead, mold, asbestos, and home inspectors. We have a board for that. Uh, they need to be regulated, evidently. But during the uh, last meeting, I believe, we did uh, vote to go along with the governor's recommendation to get rid of remediating or uh, having a board to license mold remediation. I thought that was a great thing. We spent 18 months putting together a way to regulate mold. And uh, anything more than four square feet of mold would require a mold inspector to come in. So if you've got a piece of discolored drywall, you'd have to have a mold inspector come in and then have your contractor fix it, and then have the mold inspector approve it. And we did away with that whole, whole program. I thought that was a great thing. I also serve on the board for contractors. Uh, it's self-funded. The contractors pay fees, so it does not uh, cost the taxpayer anything. And a matter of fact, if we get a surplus, Doug Weiler decided that the board for contractors had a surplus, and he advocated, abscond with it. It does. Uh, the three boards that he, uh, or professions he was going to deregulate was the molded inspectors, that's done. Hair braiders. To my knowledge, we still regulate hair braiders. We haven't been able to get that through. And I remember talking about interior designers at our last meeting. Okay. And that too uh, has not been done away with. Thank you. Our government policies promoting traditional values and an impediment to forging collaborative efforts between constitutional conservatives and social conservatives. I would say no. Uh, the burden is to, uh, for the social conservatives to articulate why behaviors are uh, positive, have either have a positive outcome or a negative outcome. Government should encourage uh, religion, should encourage chastity. Those things uh, should be supported because they have a positive outcome. There are some things that uh, generate good citizens, intact families, mothers and dads, that are self-responsible, that have uh, responsibilities put on them by the government rather than uh, being given money and having those responsibilities taken care of, taken off of them, and given to the government. So I think that that is something that we can work together on, but the burden is on the social conservatives to show why uh, it's of value to promote good behavior and virtue. So if you want more of something, you incentivize it, right? And, and, and so that's kind of how I look at this. Again, I, I don't. I don't think it's appropriate for me to take my religious values and legislate them. I don't. I don't. I don't think that's what we. What, what, what we should do and what the founders had in mind. However, we certainly need to encourage morality and good decision making. You can. You can have abstinence-based sexual education without having it from a Christian concept, because what Todd said ultimately, you're encouraging behavior that will lead to. And this is going to sound collectivist, but the greater good for society. And and so we are genuinely all in this together. I just look at it from the right instead of the left. And so we should subsidize good behavior, not bad. That is, if you don't want, 
illegitimacy, then don't create programs that allow people to have illegitimacy. If you want to have intact families, then don't tell families that it's okay if there's not a dad. Now, I'm going to tell you what, if you take a man, at least me man, and you tell him you don't need him enough time, see or later, he's going to find something else to do. That's just how we're wired. And so when you create a program that says, well, if there's not a dad around, it's okay, we got your back. So here or later, a lot of men are going to take a walk. So we've incentivized bad behavior. Now, is it socially, uh, is, that, is, that, is that dictating Christian dogma on the masses? I don't think so by any stretch of the imagination. It's recognizing, as Todd said, that decisions have outcomes. That with, at some level, either the individual or the collective will have the responsibility of dealing with the outcomes of those decisions. And then deciding to govern in, a manner, govern in a manner such that we encourage good outcomes, intact families that don't need government aid, and educated children who recognize the value of freedom and, 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 and the choices have consequences. And so that's how I think you reconcile it. I, I think, again, I am a Christian, but I'm not a Christian senator. I'm a senator. And I compartmentalize the two. I think Jefferson did. I think he was right. You know, there's, there is, there's no such thing as private values. I mean, there's either right and wrong, or there's right and wrong. There, there is an absolute. And this idea that I hear over and over again is, well, that's what I privately believe. I remember Tim Kaine ran, well, I'm privately pro-life, but I'm publicly pro-choice. I'm like, what in the world does that mean? Um, there aren't private values. There is an absolute. The fact that we don't have absolutes are what, what has created the problem that we have. Now, to say, I, to use the idea of social conservatives, I think, um, is a disadvantage to social conservatives. We didn't need social conservatives 50, 85 years ago because people had values and self-responsibility. If you had told my great-grandfather or even my grandfather, or, and especially the founding fathers, that we may not know what the definition of marriage is in 80 years. We may not be able to define whether or not murder is actually taking a life. We're going to have that debate in 50 years to determine if murder means taking a life. Or in 50 or 80 years, we're going to have the debate to determine what is gender, what is male and what is female. Um, we're going to determine if, with the Gosnell trials that you just saw, that would not have been murder if he had been successful in accomplishing what he was trying to accomplish. The fact that we're having these questions and these debates is because society is at fault. Not government. It's because society is at fault. So we need to look inward about what is our responsibility and what needs to be done. If we take self-responsibility in our communities and our churches, then we won't have to look to government to fill a definition that's always existed for hundreds of years. Sorry, my life revolves around taking notes, and so I have to that. Unelected bureaucrats today implement and enforce regulations that clearly ignore the very safeguards the Constitution was designed to afford us. Our members of, Cong our members of Congress abdicating their responsibility to rein in these agencies. Todd? Well, you've got to put it into context. And they, these individuals don't think that they're doing that. They've been elected by individuals that want things from them, uh, and they're giving those individuals what they want. Another thing we need to understand is that we don't have so much a problem with elected officials. We have a problem with people who elect them. With three or four seats in the Senate uh, over the last 20 years, we could have a whole different uh, government but we were always a few seats short, and we could not get that, that tipping point in change. So Jamie alluded to it somewhat, that the problem is, we as individuals, the church has gotten very, very weak in America. Uh, we don't hear sermons uh, from the pulpit on citizenship, on morality. Uh, it's just a, a rare thing today. Uh, the church has become something for the individual rather than challenging the individual to do something for God and their fellow man. Yeah, 
in a republic, the responsibility lies with who? The people. So, there's a reason why Congress's approval rating is, I think at this point it's in single digits. If it wasn't before, it's now after the IRS and Benghazi and, and privacy issues. And yet people keep re-electing their, elect, their elected officials. Because, well, my guy's good. Is it everybody else's that's a problem? There, there is a challenge, in, though, with a government that centralizes in, in D.C., which is why our founding fathers really emphasized federalism and government the state. Because it is impossible, or nearly impossible, for you to keep track of all the... You think about how overwhelmed you are trying to keep track of everything Washington, D.C. is doing, everything Tom's doing in the state senate, and, and everything that your local county government is doing and school board's doing. And you still have a life. It's very difficult. I'm, I'm a geek at this stuff, and I cannot keep track of it all. And so what happens is we have really moved, I believe, into an aristocracy where the lobbying groups, all these different interest groups, on the right and on the left, are sort of controlling the chess pieces. Because you as an individual can't keep track of the thousands of things that are going on in all three branches of government, all three levels of government. And unless we are willing to seriously cut down the size of Washington, D.C., and the state government, which I will put in a note to say the fact that a Republican governor and a Republican Senate and a Republican House voted for the largest tax increase in the history of Virginia is an abomination to the Republican Party. Absolute abomination. And we have the same thing going on in D.C., on whether it's on illegal immigration, whether it's on spending in the debt, so going on $17 trillion. But it is up to you guys. It is. For the record, I voted against it. <laughs> I don't think I'd be here. I don't think I'd be here tonight if I hadn't. Um, it's, I mean, I, I, I saw this question and I thought about stories that I could tell. Because it's worse than you think. And I, and I don't, and frankly, I can actually, I would, I, I'm not going to waste my time defending lobbyists, but lobbyists actually serve a function. But the, the mid-level bureaucrats who survived from administration to administration, Shulman was appointed under the Bush administration, but, but the guy gave money to John Kerry the year before, but that's their cover. Well, Shulman was appointed under the Bush administration. The mid-level bureaucrats are making policy. The last time I saw a statistic, there were 127 federal regulations promulgated for every law passed. But every one of the regulations has the force of law because if you don't obey it, they will either take your property or your liberty. And so we got this thing upside down. Now, the, the biggest conflict that I have is uh, trying to do what Jamie does, and that is keep a finger on everything going on in, in my county and then in my Senate district with my, with my, my part-time job, do my day job, and then keep an eye on my federal government. Um, and Jefferson said that a citizen legislature is, legislature is best, and I agree, and it's driving me nuts because it's just really hard to amalgamate everything information-wise that we need to. But the real power is wielded by the middle. And I could tell you stories that would curl your hair. I got 40 seconds. So, uh, wetlands mitigation, the federal government says that we have to purchase credits to, to offset development of wetlands, which could be, you know, a mud puddle. Um, you have to do that, that and when you buy a credit, you're buying something that's been placed into its permanent natural wetland state for perpetuity. That means forever for those who were smart enough not to go to law school. Um, and so the county next to us with the letter uh, in the alphabet that is the same as Hanover's wants to build a reservoir. And so they get some land in Cumberland County, but the wetlands mitigation market is so expensive, please don't blow the whistle, I may be doing the same, is so expensive that the impact to the county fiscally would be cost prohibitive. That means that federal regulatory policy makes it impossible for them to build on budget a reservoir. So what do they do? They go to the Department of Forestry, they take a state forest that's already in conservation for perpetuity and create their own wetlands mitigation pool and then buy at a reduced rate, skip in the private sector and the market that they created. And the, fed, and the bureaucrats at the federal and state level let it happen. And nobody said a darn word, except for me. But, I mean, this is terrible. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Medicare collects an average of $168,000 over a recipient's lifetime and yet spends $363,000 
over that same lifetime per recipient. Can a senior on Medicare who resists reform of Medicare be a true fiscal conservative, or are they being hypocritical when they resist reform? Who wants to take this first? I'll start with the short answer. You guys can fill in the blanks. Yes, they are being hypocritical. Uh, the other thing I want to mention, this applies to Social Security and Medicare, is that these individuals should expect to fail. They have, we have, engaged in a Ponzi scheme, so we shouldn't be surprised when we don't get what is expected from that Ponzi scheme. There's a very real chance that Social Security will collapse to some extent uh, long before I get any benefits. So I think that's something that needs to be discussed also with the local counties and the, uh, the pensions, things of that nature. You could see from the beginning that they were unsustainable. Defined benefit uh, retirement plans. Uh, they're beginning to change them. But to those of you that have a defined benefit plan, I would say as a taxpayer, you should expect to get less than you were promised because you signed on to something that was unsustainable. There, make that sound good. So New York City, I believe, pays more money for retirement benefits for law enforcement professionals than they pay to run the current police department. So just piggybacking on Todd. Now, having said that, there are a lot of people in this audience who I would imagine would find themselves in a position, and I hope one day to be old enough to find myself in a position where I might avail myself of Medicare. So what we have here is a wonderful hypothetical question where uh, principle runs headlong into reality. So th the best answer I can come up with is do what you're doing right now, and that is work, work, work like the devil to change the system while recognizing that if you use it, I guess it's okay. It's what you got right now. Um, and that's a terrible, maybe overly pragmatic answer, but we don't live in a theoretical world, we live in a real world. So what we have to do, I think, is work to change it, recognize that we live in a nation where if we, if we have an idea and a little bit of elbow grease, we can put ourselves in a situation where we don't need to worry about being in that pool. And then it also exists within the reality with which we're, we find ourselves confronted. I mean, I, I would never shame somebody who was sick and a senior who was availing themselves of Medicare just because the system's stupid and broken. But it's stupid and broken. So our duty then is to work to change it. I'm going to give you the 30 seconds back that I stole. <laughs> when I campaigned for U.S. Senate and traveled all over the Commonwealth, I, would, I spoke in a number of uh, retirement communities, senior citizen communities, uh, and I was always sort of found it interesting that individuals would come up to me or ask me in a forum like this, I'm as conservative as they get, Jamie. I am like right-wing, crazy extreme. But you're not going to touch my Medicare, are you? You're not going to touch my Social Security, are you? Um, and I always found that to be sort of a fascinating question. Now, I had this conversation with my mother on the way up from uh, Florida last week, and she sort of had the same reaction, too. Part of it is the genius of government manipulation. Because they garnish your wages, right? To take that money out of your check every, every two weeks. And you don't realize how much you're actually putting into that. But you know that they're taking your money. And so that, that natural human instinct is, I want my money back. That's my money. I want my money. What people don't realize is what they want is they want $3 for every dollar they're putting in. But you don't realize that. Most people don't realize that. They think, I just want to get what I put into it. But they don't realize is that they're getting out way more than they actually put in. So I would challenge people, well, okay, I will give you your money back plus interest. I'll give you money back plus interest. What are you going to do when it's all gone? I mean, that, that's where you have to move. And you, that was why we had Ryan and others try, and DeMint making the argument that people should be able to make the decision about what you want to do with your money. If you want to give it to the government to hold on for you, and let it collect interest, you go right ahead and do that. Or, if you decide, I want to save for my own retirement and my own health care and have a health savings account, you should be able to do that. But if I were you, I wouldn't give my money to the government if I had the choice. <laughs> Tax reform. 
both federal and state, are receiving much discussion. How would a fiscal conservative reform the tax code? So I would, um, I've already said the best way to reform is to abolish the IRS. <laughs> and I'm dead serious about that. Um, when I campaigned for the U.S. Senate, I campaigned on the fair tax, which would abolish the IRS. The state would collect the money. I think that it is um, egregious to be taxing your income and not taxing your consumption. If you're, if you're rich and wealthy and have lots of boats and go out and homes and third homes and fourth homes and go on vacations and eat out every night and we ta and they're taxing consumption, that's one thing. But to tax your income is a totally different thing. And so I was for the fair tax because A, it gets rid of all those loopholes, every single one of them, and B, it gets rid of this graduated tax that people feel like Everyone feels like I'm paying 50%, he's not paying anything, but you are. In the essence, you are, because those who consume more pay more, those who consume less pay less. That is what I would do. And in the state, and I've told this to Ken Cuccinelli as well, is I would abolish the, you ready for this? Because like, you have a job this year. I would abolish the corporate income tax in Virginia, and I would abolish, I would actually abolish all the taxes in Virginia and just have a sales tax in Virginia. I'd get rid of them all. You realize that, and you may not know this, I'm going to give you another bill. If you're a photographer in Virginia, you realize that you have, they already pay sales tax for the product, but they have to actually pay for their labor. They're taking pictures. They have, they have a special tax just if you're a photographer, not just the sales tax of what they do, but they have a special tax, and Brenda Pogge almost got it through. But I would get rid of all those taxes and just have one tax. Simplify it so that you know exactly what you're paying, you know exactly what the government's taking out of your paycheck. That's what I would do.